Okay, welcome back to the Art and Science of Happiness. We are focusing on the social dimension again this week. And I have some complicated PowerPoints with some video embedded. I hope it all works. And so here we go. Good morning from my remote location in South Central Montana. This is hard work. I had to try to fix my hair and everything. And I have a short reading to do before we do our PowerPoints. It's from Roald Dahl's book, The Twits. And here is the reading. A person who has good thoughts cannot ever be ugly. You can have a wonky nose and a crooked mouth and a double chin and stick out teeth. But if you have good thoughts, they will shine out of your face like sunbeams and you will always look lovely. And now on to the PowerPoints. Good morning from my remote location. Oops, <laughs> that video tried to play a second time. It must have been so good it wanted to be seen twice. Anyway, uh, some announcements to start us with. Due to size and uploading problems, I'm going to be creating several smaller PowerPoint videos this week. This is the first one. My goal is to post a couple today and a couple tomorrow. On Thursday, we will have quiz three. More about that in a moment. Lab will continue also on Thursday, letting go of resentments. Moving on will be the theme, and uh, it will be, again, a discussion board style lab. Quiz three is going to be a creative brainstorm of a live stream Zoom or YouTube pub style happiness trivia contest starting Thursday at right about 11 a.m. I'll take a few minutes to explain what I'm doing then and then start up probably around 11.05 or so. It will be pretty darn exciting. Uh, you will have 30 questions. Uh, each will require a one or two word answer and you'll have one minute for each question. Now, before you freak out, this is not a timed test, but because you'll have more time to complete the 30 questions, but if you are tuned in live, you can compete in real time for prizes by quickly posting your answers in the chat box because Zoom has a little chat box. I think it's in the lower right hand corner. You can uh, type or speak your responses into that chat box, I believe. And then you can also take the quiz later uh, and not even tune in, although I would love it if everybody would tune in for the live stream pub quiz. I will uh, post the quiz for you to complete after the pub quiz ends and it's due midnight Saturday but you could possibly do part of it live and part of it afterward, taking longer as you need. So let's do a quick check-in. You guys know that I like to have you think back to what you are learning in this class, what you learned last week. And so this particular check-in is partly a recall from last week and partly a preview of the pub uh, quiz coming up on Thursday. It's a preview because as you check in and you think about things that you've learned from last week, the first and fifth person to email me now with something that you remember from our last week's PowerPoints and videos will win either a $5 Starbucks electronic gift card or five extra credit points. Your choice. You can have either one. Email now, john.sf at mso.umt.edu. What do you remember? Email me. I want to hear from you. You too could be a winner. I hope you are. So the benefits of being social. We covered this in part last week. In the Bono book, he talks about how social relationships, interpersonal relationships, when they're positive and healthy, that they can be a buffer against stress. They cushion us against the challenges of life. That seems like common sense. It's also supported by the, the research literature. 
people who are in social relationships, again, healthy ones, tend to live longer. Obviously, toxic social relationships are probably not the kinds of things that help us to thrive and live longer. But healthy, supportive social relationships help with our longevity. We are more healthy. In addition, uh, social relationships offer us a way to educate ourselves through observing role models. We get to watch each other. Maybe we're on a team, maybe we're in a group or a club, maybe we're in a family. Maybe we're just in a relationship, one-on-one, -on -one, friendship, romantic, either way. It can be that that role model uh, provides us with uh, better ways of being and a model for how we can improve our performance. And the last item here on the bulleted checklist is that being in social relationships often will hold us to higher performance standards. Um, we will want to be a better version of ourselves because of the relationships that we're in. Sometimes, not always. But there are more benefits of being social, and Bono talks about these in Chapter 10. Uh, being social and in relationships stimulates our cognitive development. You know, think about it. We have to be able, if we're in relationships, to see things from someone else's perspective or engage in perspective taking. We have to engage in planning as a pair or as a group instead of just for ourselves. And that means thinking about the needs and the interests of other people. We can engage in debate. All of those activities involve brain stimulation, would be lighting up if we were observing it in an MRI or a PET scan. And so much more so than if we were just doing those things all by ourselves in isolation. So human interaction, social interaction tends to also stimulate cognitive development. In another way, it also stimulates cognitive development with young children, just touch, just being held and touched in gentle and loving ways helps stimulate cognitive development in newborns and infants, probably also in adults. Bono also talks about how superordinate goals can emerge, not just competitive goals, not that we're just competing with one another, but that as a group, oftentimes we naturally begin to think of how can we accomplish something together to benefit others or benefit society. You might be working in a business or you might be in a club or on a team um, and you might be in a family and then you just naturally begin to think, what can we do together? How can we improve the world? How can we improve our community? And those superordinate goals that are about more than just ourselves is another benefit of being social. But there is a big benefit of being social that I think Bono doesn't really focus on much, and that is love, uh, loving romantic relationships. And I'm referring to it here as healthy love. And because when you're in a healthy loving relationships, obviously you're both imperfect people, but for the most part, you're able to be yourself your genuine self. You're able to get up in the morning and maybe smell bad and say things that really are not impressive and maybe are not informed. Um, maybe sometimes we just are um, feeling or being or acting in ways that are unattractive. And yet we can be ourselves and still feel accepted by that other person. That's part of a committed, loving relationship. We can be ourselves and still be accepted, experience acceptance and positive regard from the other person. In addition, having somebody who is unequivocally on our side or our team, somebody who has empathy for us, that's a powerful thing. It's a, it's a sense of, I think, security for many people to have someone who kind of has our back um, and will, will be with us through the difficult times and will celebrate with us during the happy times. I think over time that these kinds of healthy, loving relationships can be healing. They can be healing to how we feel about ourselves. They can be healing um, in ways that it's really hard to describe. Um, and I don't use the word healing very often, especially in the psychological sense, because I think it's so challenging. It's so difficult to say, oh, we're doing, we're healing people from their illnesses or their wounds. Well, I do think that over time, healthy relationships will help us rub off the rough edges, 
will help to mend the places where we feel broken. And it can help us to, um, to be comforted in the places where we have been wounded. Um, and there's something unique about loving relationships and their capacity to help us heal and grow in positive ways. I'm sure you guys all have that or have had that loving feeling or the feeling of being loved. And so if you can think to times with parents or siblings or maybe cousins or aunties, uh, grandparents, maybe with romantic partners where you really felt accepted, where you felt prized, where you felt valued for being you. And that's a really powerful, powerful and profound experience. Now, of course, we can only be accepted and prized um, imperfectly. Nobody can perfectly value us for every way in which we are our unique selves. But, and so we shouldn't expect our partners to be perfect in how they accept us. But usually healthy relationships, they have some of that reciprocal mutual exchange of acceptance and valuing. And so think of your own stories, and then I'm going to share a story here in a short video clip. One relationship story from when I was doing uh, therapy with uh, youth at Travel Creek Job Corps that comes to mind that I think taught me something about how incredibly important love is. I had a guy I was working with, he must have been about 21 or so, never had ever before in the history of time had a girlfriend and then suddenly got one. And I think, I think I was actually more nervous than he was about the possibility of rejection or a breakup because I knew how important it was to him, how much he really wanted to be in a relationship. Uh, and I remember trying to creep up on that issue with him and talk about, well, you know, you probably always should be prepared for a breakup. You should probably always think about what could go wrong, what could go right, what's wonderful and, and cool about this, and what could also go wrong. And I remember he said, you know, I know you're worried about this, but I'm not, because, and he quoted Shakespeare, it's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved before. And, uh, and that just really taught me a lesson about how I think love is so important and so valuable to us as people that uh, it's worth, it's often, often worth the risk. Okay, so it's often worth the risk and worth the risk to reach out and as Brene Brown might say, to be vulnerable, to let ourselves be vulnerable and reach out in risky ways to connect with other people for friendships and for romantic relationships. But if being with someone can be healing, then being rejected can be damaging or at least painful. It can wound us psychologically and emotionally. So I have a short video on that as well. Hey, let's talk about relationships. And uh, in particular, let's talk about uh, rejection. So 
how do you how do you choose friends? Um, do you choose friends because of mutually uh, enjoyable activities or common interests, or maybe sometimes we choose friends because they're different than us and they bring something into our lives that we don't naturally bring into our own lives. Anyway, let's just say that uh, two people become friends. Uh, Sigmund Freud becomes uh, friends with Captain America and you know, they get along and they have some good times together. But then at some point, one of them decides, hmm, you know, I'm kind of tired and I would like to not have so much of a friendship. And this can happen after the relationship has been going on for a while. It can also happen at the very beginning, and maybe they first meet, and Captain America is like, hmm, I'm not so sure about this guy, and Freud thinks, ah, I kind of like Captain America. And Captain America is thinking, I don't really like hanging out with this guy who smokes cigars all the time, and he's always psychoanalyzing me, it's just no fun. Anyway, so at the beginning, it can be painful if Freud gets rejected by Captain America. Later on, after they've been friends, it can even be more painful. Um, but what amps up the pain even more is if it's a romantic relationship. Let's say, for whatever reason, Captain America is romantically attract, uh, attracted to Freud. And, um, and yet Freud is not, does not reciprocate. He's not attracted back. And what happens? I think what happens oftentimes is Captain America begins to wonder why. Why is it that Sigmund is not attracted to me? And he starts to think in his head, what, what's, going, what's wrong with me? Uh, and I, it, when I was doing a lot of psychotherapy, um, I worked with people who were just breaking up and or just had broken up. And oftentimes the, the lingering question was always, why? Why has this person rejected me? What's wrong with me? Why doesn't the person just tell me? Why, not, why aren't they honest with me and give me some feedback? And Almost always, even when there was feedback, it wasn't enough. It wasn't clear enough. There was still um, there were still unresolved feelings. And so, I think when it comes to breaking up and getting over it, uh, there are really three choices. Uh, one is to blame yourself and to, and and to really kind of introspect and say, ah, well. The, the downside of that is it can get too harsh and you can be too negative about yourself and you can start to conclude that I'm not lovable. Maybe nobody ever will care for me or love me. You can blame the other person, which you know might feel better to you. It might preserve your ego and yet you don't really learn anything from it other than mm, why did I get attracted to a person who now I think is a jerk. I think the third option is the best. And that's when you take a step back and you say to yourself, what can I learn about myself from this breakup? What can I learn about what attracts me to other people? And what can I learn about what I want from relationships? And so even if it's super hard, the breakup is incredibly painful, I think it's worth stepping back and saying, hmm, what can I learn about myself, about what I like from relationships, and maybe with that learning, you can make it so you can have an even better romantic relationship in the future.
Okay, so we're going to review the facts that we covered in this PowerPoint. But in leaving off on the theme of rejection, I just want to say that it's really hard to recover from rejection and think about, consider what information could you get from someone else about yourself that would make it feel like you were resolved. I was asking my doc students this question and they said they don't think that there's anything that it's just one of those things that you have to move on from even though you have incomplete information. What's especially hard in relationship breakups is that the person got to know you and then chose to reject you. And that's really tough and painful. And I do hope that you can find the strength and the perspective if you experience rejection to step back and really be more intellectual about it and say, well, what can I learn from this? How can this make me a better person, a better partner, and more successful in relationships going forward? So the review. Obviously, interpersonal or social relationships have big benefits. We talked about a number of them, cognitive stimulation or brain development, health, longevity, superordinate goals that we can strive for with others to improve the world and our communities and ourselves. And then uh, love and the acceptance and personal growth that love and loving relationships can bring. That might be really the biggest benefit, the most therapeutic in a sense, um, the most um, possibility for giving us well-being and longer term happiness. And then also we talked about rejection and it can be damaging. So we need to be able to step back and learn from rejection. So I have my conclusions. I hope you have your conclusions. What do you want to remember from this short PowerPoint, PowerPoint video? And I'm having trouble talking now. And what do you already remember? How can you mix this with things that you already know? And uh, how can you take this information and use it in your life in the future?